This is Big Ideas from the ABC. The theme I've chosen uh, may not surprise you that uh, where there is injustice, there will not be peace. Despite the wealth of this country, um, there are many injustices which are needless, pointless and, and quite shocking. And the point of my talk tonight, my plea to all of you is simple. If you take nothing else away from what I say tonight, please remember to speak against injustice. Do not collaborate with those who inflict injustice. Now, it won't surprise... <laughs> it won't surprise you that I will focus tonight on injustice to refugees because it is one of the great and willful injustices in our society which runs like a poison through the Australian body politic. Not all refugees, of course, just one group, the boat people. But that injustice is not the only available example. Most marginalised groups in Australia will experience injustice that uh, most of us, the rest of us, are spared. The homeless, the elderly, people with a mental disability, the original inhabitants of Australia, um, reasons for injustices like these are not hard to find, but they are a paradox because I think that most Australians, if they were asked, would say that they think that human rights are important. And I, I do believe that all but maybe a few percent of Australians think that. But we knew about the stolen generations for decades and it stirred hardly any concern in the public. We knew for years the two Australians, David Hicks and Mamdu Habib, were being held in intolerable conditions in Guantanamo Bay by our ally, the United States, without charge and without trial. We uh, know, or maybe we try not to know, that there are about 100,000 homeless people in Australia. Most of us don't pause to wonder what that's like or what can be done. In early 2010, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd announced peremptorily that Australia would not introduce a Bill of Rights, notwithstanding that the Brennan Committee had recommended that we should have one. Not only is Australia uh, the only Western nation, the only Western democracy, not to have a Bill of Rights, we are, I think, the only country in the world to have turned its mind to the possibility of a Bill of Rights in the 21st century and decided not to have one. It's not an honourable distinction. We've known for years that refugees uh, fleeing persecution risk their lives to get to safety here. We have known for years that those people are locked up regardless of the fact that they've committed no offence. And if you want to look for the low point in our approach to human rights, consider the election of September last year, the federal election of September last year. It is the only time in Australia's political history when both major political parties have courted political favour by promising cruelty to a particular group of human beings. It is probably the most shameful moment in Australia's political history. All of these things are impossible to square with the idea that we all believe that human rights are important. And unfortunately, I think the only explanation that enables you to understand the facts is that whilst most Australians would say they think human rights matter, what they really mean is that their own human rights matter and the human rights of their family and friends and neighbours matter. But for those other people, the people at the margins, the people who they're frightened of, the people they don't understand, their human rights don't matter in quite the same way because they're not really human in quite the same way. And that is not only profoundly wrong, it's profoundly dangerous. And what I think many Australians do not understand, and most Australian politicians do not understand, is that you don't have human rights because you're white or pleasant or Christian or rich. 
but because you're human. And until we get that, we will not understand human rights in this country. <laughs> this incoherent attitude to human rights probably explains Australia's continued ambivalence about the equal treatment of women. Until recently, women were undoubtedly treated as an underclass, a group whose humanity was not quite equal to the humanity of men. Uh, it's a matter of, I mean, I remember when I was growing up, married women couldn't hold jobs in some public service instrumentalities. They couldn't get home loans. Um, now, things have improved a bit since the 1960s because of the efforts of feminists, but even so, as recently as July this year, Joy McCann and Janet Wilson reported that, and I quote, across Australia, women are still significantly underrepresented, underrepresented in parliament and executive government, comprising less than one third of all parliamentarians and one fifth of all ministers. And internationally, Australia's ranking for women in national government continues to decline when compared with other countries. Now, if the position were reversed and women held most of the positions in politics, the cries of injustice would be immediate and deafening. But look at the makeup of the current federal cabinet and note how it is defended against criticism. Now, before I turn to my major theme, I want to make one, make one thing quite clear. The views I express tonight are not, emphatically not, a reflection of any political partisanship. I don't adhere to any political party, uh, although some of my critics think that I do. Um, while I hesitate to say it on the day of Gough Whitlam's profoundly moving memorial service, I have to confess I didn't vote for him when I had the opportunity, but I did admire him. And my admiration for Gough Whitlam grew over the years as the memory of his administrative shortcomings was progressively overshadowed by the scope of his vision. And I can say, I think without the burden of partisan connection, that Whitlam was a colossus. But a survey of today's political landscape shows that we're led by midgets. And <laughs> and led may not be the right word. We haven't seen a political leader in this country for decades. Now, and let's face it, we're the worst for it. You know, I mean, vision without administration can cause difficulties, but administration without vision leads you into a cul-de-sac, and I'm afraid that's where we're headed at the moment. These days, these days there are three streams of refugees who come to Australia. This is not widely understood. First, there are those who come through the offshore resettlement scheme. This involves us selecting people from refugee camps in other countries and bringing them to Australia. It's a, a commendable program of which we should all be proud. Uh, it's a very fine and noble thing that we do and not every country does it. The second are the people who come by aeroplane. Now, to be a plane person, you have to be able to get a passport from your country of origin, which may be tricky because if you're stateless, no country acknowledges you. And if you're a member of a persecuted minority, some governments will not actually help you get travel documents. But in addition, you need a visa to get to Australia. Now, it could be a tourist visa, a student visa, a uh, business visa or some such. And that um, enables you to get on a plane in, bound for Australia. If you don't have a passport or if you don't have a visa, you will not be allowed to board the plane in order to get to Australia. When you clear passport control in Australia, you can then apply for uh, protection. And once your initial visa runs out, you'll be given a bridging visa and you'll live in the community for as many months or years as it takes to assess your asylum claim. But if, and by the way, we, we, most people have no idea that there are refugee applicants living in the community on bridging visas who came in by aeroplane. But if you can't get a passport or you can't get a visa to come to Australia, then you have no means of escaping your persecutors other than using a people smuggler and getting on a boat to head towards Australia. 
Now, Australia's response to these three groups of refugees is quite interesting. Most people don't know about the offshore resettlement scheme. Most people are completely untroubled by the existence in the community of thousands of aeroplane people who live quietly in the community on bridging visas, but most people seem deeply concerned about boat people. They've been induced to see boat people as some kind of threat to our way of life. Now, this deep concern that has been scratched into existence by politicians stands trembling at the frontier which paranoia shares with delusion. Boat people who manage to get to Australia are mistreated in every possible way as if somehow that will make us feel better or safer. It started at its worst in recent times in August 2001. Back then, John Howard was looking for an excuse uh, to take a stand against the arrival of boat people because he was aware that one nation was drawing some of his supporters away. Um, the Tampa, Norwegian cargo ship, rescued a group of Afghan asylum seekers uh, who were heading in Australia's direction. But when the captain of the Tampa tried to enter the territorial waters off Christmas Island, John Howard took a stand and told them they could not proceed. Um, when eventually the captain of the Tampa uh, defied Howard and entered Australian territorial waters off Christmas Island, Howard sent the SAS out who took command of the bridge at gunpoint. When he went into the parliament later to explain his stance on Tampa, he was approached in the lobby by Jackie Kelly, who was then a member of the Liberal Party and who held a Western Sydney seat. She said, John, I'm very concerned about One Nation. Some of my supporters are drifting across that way. Howard is said to have shaken his Tampa speech at her and said, don't worry, this will fix it. It was an explicitly political reaction. Now, it was a, an accident of history that the Tampa episode happened in late August, early September 2001. The judgment of Justice North in the federal court at first instance was handed down at 2.15 p.m. Melbourne time on the 11th of September 2001. It was not a good day to win a case, although it was a win um, of sorts. It uh, was interesting, to, with hindsight, to reflect on the fact that there had never been a hint during the running of the trial in front of Justice North, never a hint that any of the people rescued by the Tampa might be terrorists. But after September 11, everything changed. And in the appeal to the full federal court, which happened on 13th of September from memory, uh, the suggestion was floated that some of the people rescued by Tampa might be terrorists. Because then, in the wake of September 11, we didn't have Muslims, we only had Muslim terrorists. And we didn't have boat people, we only had Muslim boat people, and they were potential terrorists. And the whole stage was set for the poisoning of the public mind about boat people. The Pacific Solution was set up uh, at the same time, in fact, during the running of the Tampa case. And then, of course, it faded away because the boats had stopped coming. And by the time Kevin Rudd became the uh, Prime Minister in late 2007, there were virtually no refugee boats arriving in Australia at all. And while it's true that in the middle of 2008, Rudd's government introduced sweeping reforms to the treatment of boat people, it's hard in retrospect not to see that as a cynical nod towards those of us who thought that mistreating asylum seekers was a bad idea because uh, at the time the boats weren't coming and all his reforms amounted to was this, we promise to treat you well as long as you don't come here. Now, uh, sometime later in I think late 2009 from memory, Tony Abbott took over leadership of the coalition and he started criticising Rudd because some refugee boats had started coming. Rudd changed his stance dramatically and launched a ferocious attack on, on people smugglers. Apparently, he had forgotten that his moral hero, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was also a people smuggler. Now, while it's true that refugee boats had started arriving again, and it's true that boat people arrived uh, during the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd Rudd prime ministerships, it's a quite separate question 
whether we should be concerned about the arrival of boat people. After all, more than 90% of them over the last 15 or so years have been assessed by us as genuine refugees legally entitled to protection. Now, it's not hard to make the argument that we are improved as a country if we can treat people decently who have the courage and the initiative to risk their lives seeking to get to a place of safety. It's It's very difficult to make a plausible argument that we're improved as a country if we're deliberately cruel to innocent people. And yet, that is the point of the stop the boats mantra. Stop the boats is one of those three word slogans which seems to have taken the country by storm and is now seen as an objective which is intrinsically good in itself. The argument has never been made to explain why it's a good thing to keep boat people away. One argument that's put forward is, well, look, they might drown if they try to come here, and it's true. One or two percent of boat people do drown. But the argument never stops to acknowledge the fact that if they don't run for their lives, if they stay back and face the Taliban, if they're killed by the Taliban or the Rajapaksa government or whatever other government is persecuting them, they're just as dead as if they drowned. The difference, of course, is that they won't be dying in a way that's visible to us and our conscience will be clear. Stopping the boats is nothing more than displacing the location where people die. And frankly, the idea that we've stopped the boats should not please any of us. <clears throat> what the people should recognise who chant the mantra, stop the boats, what they should recognise is that the very people who get here as boat people have the courage and the initiative to make a run for it, to try and escape persecution and risk their lives in the process. And furthermore, those people are fleeing the same extremists we're fighting in the Middle East. The other thing which is overlooked in this rather shabby debate we've had in this country over the last uh, 13 years or so is that the largest number of boat people ever to arrive in Australia in modern times came in 2012 with a total of just over 24,000 people arriving on our shores seeking asylum. It overlooks also, by the way, the fact that the largest ever arrival rate of uninvited boat people was in the last week of January 1788. And you could. <laughs> and you could, without distorting the truth, have referred to a number of them as illegals. <laughs> now, 24,000 people is, is the record number in, uh, in the last few decades arriving by boat seeking asylum. Uh, it, no matter how you look at it, it's hard to see this as a big number. Um, our average annual intake of new permanent migrants, not people fleeing persecution, just people moving to another country, is about 200,000 a year. The average number of people who arrive in Australia each year uh, um, for tourism, business, study, whatever, is around about 5 million. About 5 million people cross our borders each year with passports and visas. Now, these comparisons are important because when you think about it, the politicians used to worry about border control. Well, if five million people come into Australia each year with visas and 24,000 get through without visas, that's a failure of border control of less than one half of 1%. And I'm still young enough to remember that at school, a score of 99.5% was regarded as quite good. <laughs> But the coalition persisted in calling boat people illegals and queue jumpers, language which started in the immediate aftermath of Tampa. When it won office in September 2013, the incoming coalition government changed the department's name to the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. And the obvious dog whistle message of that was that these people are criminals from whom we need to be protected. 
Tragically, sadly, for reasons I don't understand, Labor has never denounced these things as false. Neither in opposition nor in government has Labor stated authoritatively that boat people are not illegal, that they do not commit any offence by coming here the way they do, seeking protection from persecution. They are not a danger to us. Uh, and there's no queue, by the way. It is perhaps the greatest failure of democracy in Australian history that Labor has never contradicted the coalition's dishonest message about asylum seekers. The coalition called them illegal, it's a lie. The coalition called them queue jumpers, it's a lie. The coalition suggests that we need to be protected from them, it's a lie. When he became Minister for Immigration, Scott Morrison ordered that the department refer to irregular maritime arrivals as illegal maritime arrivals. It's a lie. I recently received a copy of a letter written to an Australian signed by Tony Abbott on the Prime Minister's letterhead. It's dated 27 August 2014. Um, dear so-and-so, thank you for letting me know your views about illegal boat arrivals. Illegal boats put lives at risk. In the first page of the letter, he uses the word illegal six times in reference to asylum seekers. It's a lie. The most depressing thing... <laughs> the most depressing thing about this is that so much of the country has been seduced into thinking these people are criminals, we need to be protected from them, and any sort of cruelty to them is justifiable. Um, when people arrive in Christmas Island, uh, which is the most common place of arrival in Australia for people fleeing persecution, when people arrive there, they have typically been at sea for eight or ten days. They are typically people who come from landlocked countries who've never even seen the ocean before, let alone been in a small boat on the ocean. They have typically not had enough food or water to drink. They have typically not had the opportunity to wash or to change their clothes, they typically arrive in clothes which are caked with their own excrement. When they arrive, they are not even allowed the dignity of showering and changing before they're interviewed by an officer of the Department of Immigration. I don't understand um, how, do, how does any civilised nation justify that sort of deliberate humiliation? I had a conversation with a doctor who worked on Christmas Island for IHMS, who deliver all of the medical services to the Department of Immigration. She told me the story of a woman who'd come from, I think, Iran from memory, who'd been in detention on Christmas Island for uh, a number of weeks and was generally thought to be mad although no one could understand quite what her madness was. One of the difficulties with people who arrive at Christmas Island is that if they have any medical devices, those are confiscated and not returned. So spectacles, hearing aids, false teeth, prosthetic limbs, all confiscated and not returned. If they have any medications with them, those are confiscated and not returned. Someone spends their time popping pills out of blister packs into a rubbish bin for later disposal. If they have medical documentation explaining their medical needs, that documentation is confiscated and not returned. So this woman's condition was completely unknown, but her behaviour was bizarre. The doctor who told me the story explained that she had about a 25-minute consultation with this woman, a consultation made more difficult because although they were on opposite sides of the table, the interpreter was in Sydney at the other end of a telephone. That made diagnosing the problem more difficult. It turned out that the woman was incontinent of urine, and while she'd been given a change of clothes, she didn't have any underwear and she couldn't leave her cabin without having urine running down her leg, and it was driving her insane. The doctor asked the department to provide incontinence pads. Their first response was, we don't do those. She insisted. They agreed to provide four per day, which apparently is not adequate. The lady has to queue up if she wants more. But eventually, the woman received incontinence pads and her demeanour changed instantaneously. What justification can there be for the sort of humiliating treatment of people who've just come here escaping persecution? Um, you all would have read in the newspapers that in February this year, Reza Barati was killed uh, in Manus Island. Initially, the government said that he had escaped from the detention centre and was killed outside. 
Later, that was shown to be a lie. Uh, although it took nearly five months for anyone to be charged with Reza Barati's killing, I received a sworn statement from a, an eyewitness just two weeks after the event. It explained that an, an employee of the detention centre, armed with a length of timber with two nails driven through it, had lashed out at Reza Barati and had brought down two crushing blows on his head, lacerating his scalp with the nails that were still protruding from the timber. He fell to the ground and was then kicked repeatedly by a dozen employees uh, from within the detention centre, including two Australians. They kicked him in the head and in the stomach as he tried to protect himself with his arms. And then another employee of the detention centre got a rock and brought it down on Reza Barati's head with such ferocity that it killed him. And the person who'd sworn the statement said, I knew he was dead because when they kicked him, he stopped reacting. Now, it has been months since, it's now been eight months since Reza Barati was killed. No one has been brought to trial. My understanding is that some people in the Manus Island Detention Centre are being offered the opportunity of being taken to mainland Australia on condition that they withdraw any witness statements they've made. Um, let me tell you another instance. A man who came from Saddam Hussein's Iraq was noted in the department's uh, records as being a sufferer from torture and trauma in Iraq. He'd been held in Abu Ghraib prison. They noted in their notes that the form of torture that most terrified him was being locked in a small room because he had been held in a small cell in Abu Ghraib prison and electrocuted randomly through water on the floor. After about 15 or 18 months, as is characteristic, he lost hope. He fell into a state of despair and began to harm himself. And what he would do is to find anything that was sharp and cut himself. The Department of Immigration would then treat him with Panadol, which is the universal cure, and solitary confinement in a small cell. That didn't improve things. He'd get out, he'd cut himself again, they'd give him Panadol and put him back into a small cell. This went on for five years. And eventually, eventually, uh, some lawyers in Adelaide took a case to the federal court asking for nothing more adventurous than that this man should be admitted to the Glenside Psychiatric Hospital in Adelaide for assessment and, if necessary, for treatment. The department resisted the application and they fought it out for two weeks. Eventually, the judge made it clear that the men should be, the men, this man and some others, should be admitted to Glenside for assessment and, if necessary, treatment. And on, a, on arrival at Glenside, this man was examined physically and mentally. On physical examination, they found he had 10 metres of scarring on his body from self-harm inflicted in the, in the detention centre. And this was a person who the department thought need nothing more than Panadol. The sad truth of the position we've reached in this country is that just as a person's character is judged by their conduct, so a country's character is judged by its conduct. And the way we have behaved towards asylum seekers in this country says very bad things about our character as a nation. But there's an explanation. It's only so because we've been persuaded falsely that these are dangerous criminals from whom we need to be protected. And if that were true, well then with, within some limits, perhaps there'd be some justification. We have a vision of ourselves in this country, part of which is reflected in the words of the, uh, of the national anthem, but I suspect we see ourselves as sort of part crocodile Dundee, part outback sheep farmer, um, sun bronzed Aussies, we just happen to be in the city at the moment. It's accidental. <laughs> it comes as a sobering uh, reality to learn that overseas we're seen as cruel and selfish. And it's not surprising when you consider what we are doing to people who come here seeking nothing more than protection. We are, it seems to me, a nation struggling with itself. We're struggling with our own fears 
and we will never find peace until we can see past the lies and acknowledge the truth about what we're doing, the truth that boat people aren't illegal, that they aren't criminals, that we don't need to be protected from them, that we need to recognise that our politicians have persuaded us to betray the real character of this country. Time, in short, for us to seek peace by rediscovering the truth about what we are doing, what we have done, and get back to behaving the way we can and the way we should. In the, in the few minutes that I have left, and I'm told I'm on a pretty strict timetable, but yeah, well, what can they do? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, wa I want to turn to another form of injustice, which is also in large measure justified by our politicians through a tissue of lies and misrepresentations. And really, really, we ought to know better. We ought to know better than to believe what the politicians tell us about these things. And I'm talking all parties. Um, ASIO, as you know, has the power to perform security assessments. If a person is adversely assessed on security grounds, it doesn't mean they're a terrorist. It just means that the um, whatever administrative step might otherwise be taken is said to be not desirable by reference to Australia's national security interests. Now, if you're uh, an Australian and you're adversely assessed, that can result in your passport being cancelled. It can result in your job application for various government positions being refused. Or if you're a non-citizen, it can result in you being um, denied a visa. Or if you have a visa, it will be cancelled. Now, um, cancellation of a passport following an adverse assessment can be challenged in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Um, the AAT Act provides that um, the Attorney General can grant a certificate which, in substance, creates the conditions for very serious injustice. Uh, let me tell you one story. An Australian citizen discovered to his inconvenience that his passport had been cancelled. The reason was the adverse ASIO assessment. He applied to the AAT for, for a review of ASIO's decision to adversely assess. The tribunal made the usual orders that, the, uh, that ASIO provide any documents relevant to the assessment, um, and the documents were provided, or at least some of them were provided, not all of them. Uh, and the documents that were provided were largely blanked out so that you had some headings and nothing really very interesting or useful at all. Um, there was a certificate of the Attorney General which authorised ASIO to withhold the full content of the documents and to withhold the documents that hadn't been provided and which also went on to say that he withheld permission for anyone acting on behalf of the applicant being present in the tribunal when ASIO gave its evidence or made its submissions. So along with a very able junior barrister, um, I went down to the AAT and spent two days sitting outside the hearing room wondering what the hell was going on inside the hearing room. And when eventually we were invited inside to make submissions, I didn't know what to say because we didn't know what case we had to meet. Um, we received a decision in two parts. The non-secret part, which we were allowed to see, said that there was nothing in the material available to us which would have justified the adverse assessment. But it went on to say that for the reasons contained in their secret reasons, the assessment was upheld. Uh, to this day, I don't know what on earth this fellow was supposed to have done or said or thought that was inappropriate for him holding a passport. Um, the practical reality was that he could not get a fair hearing. Um, Another case for, a re you may remember that when the Pacific Solution Mark I closed down, everyone from Nauru was brought over to Australia. They'd all been assessed as refugees. They were brought to Australia and settled here, except for two Iraqis. These two men weren't given visas to Australia because they'd been adversely assessed by ASIO. The reason for the assessment was not known to anyone, at least not to us. Um, one of them, had a mental breakdown when faced with the prospect of spending the rest of his life in detention on Nauru. He was medically evacuated to Brisbane. And whilst he was in a mental hospital in Brisbane, ASIO changed his mind. 
and assessed him as appropriate to get a visa, and so he remains in Australia with a visa. It seems that going mad makes you less of a concern to our security apparatus. Um, the other man was so affronted by having been adversely assessed, he wanted to challenge it. The case went to the federal court. Uh, in evidence, he and his colleague both swore that they had never done or said or thought anything that would bring them within the reach of the very wide provisions of the ASIO legislation. Their evidence was not challenged. It was not contradicted. Nothing was put forward to suggest that either of them had ever done anything at all that was wrong. ASIO's argument to the judge was that because the judge didn't know what ASIO had taken into account in adversely assessing, they couldn't say it was wrong. And the judge agreed. It's a grotesquely, a grotesquely unfair system when a person's life can be blighted by the decisions of someone nameless and faceless and they're not even allowed to know what legal test is applied or what facts have been applied to that legal test. And at the moment, in Australia, there are 30 people who fall into that unlucky group. People who've been assessed by us as refugees, but who've been refused protection visas by, because of being adversely assessed by ASIO. One case which many of you will be familiar with is the case of Ranjini, the Sri Lankan Tamil woman whose first husband was a driver for the Tamil Tigers during the civil war in Sri Lanka. Um, he was killed by the Rajapaksa government. She came with her children and a new husband to Australia. One day she was called into the department and her visa was cancelled. She has now spent more than two and a half years in immigration detention in Sydney, which was said to be more appropriate even though her husband lives in Melbourne, um, in, held in detention for more than two and a half years and no one is allowed to know why. No one is allowed to know what it is she's supposed to have said or done that justifies jailing her without charge, without trial. As best we can work out, looking, reading between the lines, it seems that she may be regarded as a risk to the security of Sri Lanka if she returns there, and she doesn't want to. But if she's a risk to the security of Sri Lanka or potentially a risk to the security of Sri Lanka, that means she can be adversely assessed on security grounds by Australia. So the very same facts which entitle her to refugee status in Australia also condemn her to the rest of her life in jail in Australia. That is about as unjust as it can get. It's, it's, it's close to unbelievable that in Australia, an innocent person can be detained, if necessary, for the rest of their lives without knowing why and without any practical ability to challenge the basis for their detention. But that is where we are right now in Australia. Um, in December of 2004, the House of Lords in Britain had to deal with uh, uh, one aspect of the UK anti-terror laws. Bear in mind that in Australia, people who come here without a visa, claiming asylum, can be detained if necessary for the rest of their lives, even though they've done nothing wrong. In December 2004, the UK House of Lords had to deal with a case concerning UK anti-terrorist laws. The law provided, in essence, that if a person was a refugee, who could therefore not be removed from Britain, but was also a suspected terrorist, then that person could be detained without charge, without trial, for up to 12 months. And the question was, does this pass muster under the UK Human Rights Act? The UK Human Rights Act has got a get-out clause which says, in substance, that you can um, depart from the promises in the UK Human Rights Act if it is necessary in order to avoid a threat to the life of the nation. Eight to one, the House of Lords said, no, you can't do that. Um, even though the test for putting him away was being a suspected terrorist. But Lord Hoffman really came down with a cracker. He finished his judgment by saying, and these are words which should resonate in Australia right now, the real threat to the life of the nation in the sense of a people living in accordance with its traditional laws and political values comes not from terrorism, but from laws like these. That is the true measure of what terrorism may achieve. It's for Parliament to decide whether to give the terrorists such a victory. 
When you leave tonight, remember your government is inflicting cruelty and injustice on innocent people. Ask yourself, is this what this country is about? And if the answer is no, well then do whatever you can to change the system. We will never be at peace as a nation unless we manage to change these appalling, deliberate sources of injustice in this country. Thank you.